I appreciate the opportunity. Good afternoon, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my lecture today is Economic Occupations, the Hidden Key to Transformation. It took me a long time to make up my mind on this topic. And if you listen to the news today, you read newspaper, the issue of economic freedom is quite prominent. And it's a reality that we, as a profession, have to face. Equally, if you make an observation, I think we have slowed down to below 10 kilometers an hour when it comes to transformation process in South Africa. There was a time where we were, I think, above the speed limit. Now we have slowed down. It is a privilege and an honor for me to be elected as a recipient of the 2014 Vona Dutoit Memorial Award. Delivering the 23rd Vona Dutoit Memorial Lecture offers me an opportunity to share my thought about the direction in which the profession should be moving more than 20 years since the South African Democratic Government was voted into power. I never had the opportunity to meet Vona de Doit, but I believe that I have an understanding of what she stood for in the profession of occupational therapy. Irrespective of what Pat has already said, of the demands of her work as a principal of the Pretoria College of Occupational Therapy and a head of the clinical services section of the HF Fairwood Hospital, she presented a number of papers during national and international congresses. Vona de Toit is one of the only three South African occupational therapy of whom I'm aware who served as members of the Executive Committee of the World Federation of OT, WFOT. Vona Detroit and Rosemary Crouch, who is amongst us, served as Vice President, and I serve as an Education and Research Program Coordinator. Vona went a step further by developing what is commonly known as the Vona Detroit theory of creative ability. The theory and supporting papers are published in the book Patient Volition and Action in Occupational Therapy. South Africans, like Robin Jube, published an article on this theory. Pat Devet published a chapter in a book edited by Crouch and Alice in 2005. A number of research projects are being conducted on this theory, which will lead to further development. Examples of such research, such developments include the research conducted by Dalian Castelli, in which she analyzed Vona's theoretical assumptions, concepts, and constructs. And her article on this research is published in Sajot, 2013. I'm convinced that Vona de Deutsch was always determined to champion her cause with regard to the, the development of OT profession. According to the South African Association, uh, Otasa's submission to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, South African therapists were facing threats of being excluded from the World Federation during the apartheid years. And Vona developed her theory during this time. I, I and think, and I'm very conv uh, convinced, that the threat of isolation might have impacted negatively on international recognition of Vona during that time, uh, the theory of creative ability. We have gathered here today to remember and celebrate the contribution that she made in the de development of OT in South Africa and lately worldwide. 
the promotion of the theory of creative ability that has taken place with effect from 2008 to 2009 in the United Kingdom and Japan, under the leadership of Wendy Sherwood in the UK, and in Nakano and Sato in Japan, is evidence of Vona's ongoing contribution to the profession. So while she has moved on, her theory lives on. The Occupational Therapy Association of South Africa and the Vona and Marit Foundation, Dutoit Foundation need to be commended for keeping her memory alive and, and her work ongoing. The value of celebrating our individual and collective professional achievement cannot be measured and should never be undermined. The Congress theme rooted in Africa, diverse realities and possibilities. The first time I saw this theme, I was reminded of the words of our former state president, Tawumbegi, in parliament, when he stood up and said, I'm an African. This theme reminded me of that, and the question I asked myself is how many of us can start, stand up publicly and declare that we are indeed equally Africans? Because most of us do see ourselves as being different. Most of us do not associate with our continent. This theme leads us to, to us reflecting on these diverse realities and possibilities. And I like one author who says, understanding the history of South Africa and the impacts of its apartheid law enable one to fully understand the diverse reality and the context that characterized our country today. If you sit in your own corner and not fully go back and look at what people went through, you won't understand that there's nothing happening towards transformation at the moment. It's only those who have lived that reality. This lecture focus will focus on the reality that represents classical third world, third world living condition, which include poor socioeconomic status and living condition as opposed to those that represent classical first world societies. My observation, as I said in my keynote speech during the WFOT Congress in Sweden 2002, is that even though the democratically elected government has brought about political changes, there are areas in which progress is very slow, if any. These areas include economic freedom, poverty eradication, and land ownership. You can refer to the WFOT bulletin published in 2002 to confirm this. While there's a tendency, while there's a tendency to consider South African reality as being better than those of other African countries in terms of the livelihood of its citizen, 13.6% of the 51 million people still live in informal dwelling, and 7% in traditional dwelling. That's according to Census 2011. And for this group of people, access to service is still a challenge, particularly in both informal and traditional dwellings. I'm sure you, when you watch the news, read newspapers, Every now and then there's somewhere go, something going somewhere. It doesn't matter how people politicize it. It's a reality that some of the people are experiencing on their, their daily basis. In my view, these realities share a common possible solution, which is having economic means or capital to change their li the lives of the majority of the population. Undoubtedly, this will be in line with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, in, in which the low needs must be 
at least partially satisfied before needs that are higher in hierarchy become important sources of motivation. While some of us will wonder why community are not striving to actualize themselves, according to this writing by Nohelene and Hokkaid Sema, lower needs must be at least partially satisfied. Not fully. If they are not satisfied at all, the, the higher needs do, do not kick, kick into the picture. Satisfaction of lower order needs such as physiological and safety needs should precede higher order needs such as social ego and self-actualization. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is occupational therapy philosophy fully addressing the areas of occupations to, to satisfy the client's needs? particularly the economic needs, which forms the foundation of meeting all other needs. The other way around does not seem to work. That is, participating in leisure activity when basic needs are not satis uh, satisfied is not an option. According to the outcome of our reflection, Accordingly, the outcome of our reflection should bring about possibility that could make a difference and change to the life of the majority of the population. Hence the topic of my lecture, economic occupations, the hidden key to transformation. This topic challenges us to rethink our stance, our focus with regard to practice of occupational therapy, particularly in developing countries like South Africa, in which poverty remains one of the biggest challenges. South Africans living under the poverty line is about 41,4% of the 51 million people, according to Census 2011. Now, certainly, colleagues, you will agree with me. If our profession have to make a difference, we need to get our hands dirty and, and really not not be selective when we look at occupation and we go for the easy ones. We need to look at economic occupations, those that will change the life of people. Foray states that poverty has a, in 2004, stated that poverty has a devastating effect on occupational potential, in that it influences choice, choices of occupation and restricts opportunity for participation. I am using, and I'm forever repeating poverty, poverty, poverty. If we accept that the majority, I mean 41% is quite a higher number, are living under the poverty line, is that not an area we should be focusing on? And of course, as Harris in 2003 says, Poverty is experienced a different dimension, that is maternal poverty, absolute and relative poverty, chronic poverty, intergenerational poverty, and poverty of the capacity to aspire. That is quite challenging, where people will sit in the corner of their street the whole day and not wish to achieve anything. I, I think we have the key as occupational therapists to, to address this. Becker generally defines poverty as a state of being poor or deficit in money or means of subsistence. I think those are very powerful words. I think that is for this reason that one of the WFOT proposed priority, which relates to organizational objectives and for occupational therapists and occupational therapy association is to support the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. Here, the first goal is eradication of extreme hunger and poverty. I, I think that should be the agenda which we are adopting. This goal remains, according to the United Nations in 2014, it still remains the most important Millennium Development Goal. And yet, in developing countries like South Africa, we tend to seem to turn a blind eye to it. 
In this lecture, I would like to propose that individually and collectively, we need to embark on a new agenda by adopting a new vision regarding the use of occupations in our clients' lives. Furthermore, we need to obtain knowledge and learn strategies to improve much needed resources. In this regard, Fori proposes that all occupational therapists, even those working with individuals in conventional clinical practice, need to keep in mind the issue raised by poverty for most people in the world. I don't know how strongly to say that. The South African Government National Plan uh, Planning Commission this year in 2014 acknowledges that poverty has many dimensions that shape people's life. Poverty in South Africa is the most ev evident in the lack of opportunity for economically active citizens to earn a wage. Income poverty affects individual and household in ways that are often degrading and leads to precarious lifestyle. Without access to quality health and education and income earning opportunity, the lives of the vast majority of the poor wage a daily struggle to simply survive." End quote. Before talking about the new vision, I would like to commend the work done by different authors of books and chapters in books and journal articles capturing the practice of occupational therapy in Africa, particularly in South Africa. Their writing highlights challenges resulting from the diverse context and suggests possible solutions that could be used to address such challenges. Sometimes in my quiet moment, I wish every South African could attempt to get hold of the books and chapters I'm going to refer to now. They will challenge you. They will give you possible solutions. This includes Transformation Through Occupation, edited by Watson and Schwartz in 2004. Watson and Schwartz in 2004. Occupational Therapy in Psychiatry and Mental Health, edited by Crouch and Alice in 2005. Practice and Service Learning in Occupational Therapy, edited by Lorenzo, Duncan, Buchanan, Alsop in 2006. Occupational Therapy, an African Perspective, edited by Alice and Crouch in 2010. And Going Abroad with Contribution from South, Afri South African OTs. Occupational Therapy, Peace Without Borders, Cronenberg, Poland, and Skyro in 2011. And a chapter that I wrote together with my colleague, Lisunyane, Globalization and Occupation, Perspective from Japan, South Africa, Hong Kong. The contributors were Asaba, myself, Lisunyane, and Wong in 2010. I, I think we, we have a wealth of information which is very relevant to our context. And the question is, are we referring to it? Are we picking up their recommendation and doing anything about it? I also would like to acknowledge what Crouch in 2010 says, that some of the African countries' resources are being used in an attempt to alleviate poverty and to improve the quality of life by adequately satisfying fundamental human needs and by creating a difference. Many articles on this subject are published in the South African Journal of OT. However, each time I reflect on the contribution the occupational therapy is making in improving the livelihood of our clients, I realize that different approaches are necessary. Answers to questions such as, is our profession contributing maximally to community development and transformation process? Could encourage us to consider a new vision regarding the use of occupation that could empower individuals 
and community in our intervention strategies. Ikugu, 2011, argues that occupational therapists can contribute their knowledge of human occupation and occupational performance to help illuminate wider societal occupation-related challenges. This is a statement, and, and I appreciate and I read into it beyond what some of us may read, wider societal occupation-related challenges. If you drive out of this place towards the airport, you look through the window, you don't, you don't have to interview anybody. It's, it's, it's given that those people living in those areas are deprived and they have occupational challenges. And the question I'm asking us, I want us to consider is, can't we use this occupation that we talk and dream of every day differently to empower our communities? The paradigm of occupation has been different over the years, and Duncan note, note this in 2011. In the 1900 to the 1940s, occupation was seen as being essential to life and having an influence on people's health, whereas from the 1980s onwards, occupation was seen as having a central role in human's life by providing motive and meaning. I've come across a grown-up lady who was above 30. She shared her life story with me to say when she wakes up in the morning, she doesn't know what happens to, will happen to her. She's not sure of where she will go. If she meets anybody who is interested for company, she accompany that person as long as she's safe. And to me, I looked at her as an occupational being and said, what are OTs doing here? The shared vision of the use of occupation, of occupation by occupational therapists has been very consistent over the years. The difference, in my opinion, has been in what was emphasized in order to address the needs of society community at a particular period of time. In the 80s, 1980s saw the emphasis being on access to occupation and its impact on the quality of life. To me, it's important to ask ourselves, where is the view of occupation in terms of a vision and a philosophy of a profession? Are we keeping it there? Or are we waiting for the West to drive the show again to tell us we go that direction? Or are we going to, to, to adopt our own stand and say, in developing countries, in the context like ours, our profession will change its color and use occupation differently for economic empowerment? <coughs> like a dream deferred. In 1994, most of us have been hoping that the democratic government, through or as part of transformation process, will address all occupational risk factors, which Wilcock in 1998 refers to as occupational imbalance, deprivation, alienation, insufficiency, and injustice. Observation led to one co to conclude that not much has changed for those who were historically disadvantages, uh, disadvantaged. And for this reason, occupational therapy have to think out of the box and stop what is commonly referred to as business as usual. I propose that we should prioritize economic occupation. Participation in occupation that could lead to economic freedom, could lead to peace of mind and happiness. This proposal is no way intended to challenge the acknowledged and accepted philosophy of OT and the use of occupation to promote health and well-being, as Hakelkas said in 2002, 
to bring meaning to an individual life, as Christensen and Townsend said in 2010. I'm, however, I'm convinced that we need a paradigm shift as a profession to prioritize economic occupation. And this is a challenge from me to all of us. Occupational therapy as a profession makes use of elusive and philosophical concept most of the time. And one is surprising how much we spend debating those concepts, hoping to find a common solution. Sometimes I feel like saying, colleagues, let's move on and spend time on what matters. A good example for me remains the use of, of the word activities versus occupations. Perhaps what complicates matters such as this is the home language that an occupational therapist speak. How do I explain the differences between activities and occupation to client, clients who speak different South African official languages? Certainly in my language, th there's no difference. And we spend time trying to find that instead of moving in. Those involved in teaching students who do not have English as their home language will fully understand the challenges that I'm referring to. And I think we need to move on as a profession. We accept, we use occupation, whatever you call them, and let's use them to improve the livelihood of the communities that we serve. I acknowledge the value that meaningful occupation Uh, the value that meaningful occupations play an important role in people's lives. In addition to what different authors said about the value of occupation in human life, I also have a personal experiences of the meaning of occupations. Often when, when life seems to have no meaning, I use occupation to bring meaning in my own life. I have also counseled family members, students, and colleagues towards using occupation to cope with life's challenges. And the result is that that made their lives more meaningful. I'm not sure how many OTs have done that. In our own reality, in our families, in our, with our children, with our relatives, with our neighbors, how often do we prescribe occupation? as a solution to life problems. Often we prescribe, we refer to psychologists for counseling and so on. How often do we ch the, the, the challenge them to say, try my grammar, it will work this time. Okay? I, I've done with the students and the feedback I've received has been very positive. I've dealt with students as late as last week who were depressed, who were seeing psychologists, and I drew up an activity or occupation program for them, including aerobics and so on. And one of them came back and said, thank you very much, it works. I said, yes, I believe in this. <laughs> Nevertheless, I would like to advocate a different approach in prioritizing occupations. Watson, 2004, is of the view that reawakening possibility for development may lead to, develop, to, to transformation, enriching and redirecting life. In this lecture, I would like to note that reflecting on the current realities in South Africa, the transformation that has been taking place since 1994 have been mainly at a social level and not at individual or community level. How then can we as a profession focus on the need of the majority of our people who live in poverty and are unemployed? What do we do to ensure improvement of the quality of life and create opportunity for them to engage in meaningful occupations? How can we ensure that the process of transformation remains a priority for the poor and the marginalized who need it most? What needs to be done to make occupational therapy focus on empowerment of individuals and communities. Are we developing, advocating, and implementing projects that could lead to economic independence? I want to challenge all of us. 
to say individually, collectively, where do we stand in that aspect? Part of the transformation should be addressing the impact of deprivation by increasing productivity and empowerment. Developing strategies to ad address barriers to individuals' economic independence, which in include limited employment opportunity, lack of skills, training, experience, could keep the transformation process ongoing. Occupational therapy as a profession should look at different ways of approaching or utilizing occupation to facilitate, to maintain, and transform the life of our poor community. A paradigm shift in this concept had to do with changing the livelihood of those in need in a valid manner. In that way, we will be seen as making a difference and we will get the recognition and the acknowledgement which is long overdue to our profession. Charity and handouts should, not be, should only be a temporary measure, not a way of life, as it is the case in developing countries like South Africa. There are people who are out there seeming to wait for somebody to say, I need something, so that they hand out something and feel better. And it's a temporary measure. Occupational therapy should be obligated by the view of the Greek physician, Galen, in 172 AD, that employment is nature's best physician and is essential to human happiness. I think in this case, if we twist that around and say occupation, you see, in this instant, economic occupations, and I, I, I enjoyed listening to Lee Randall's presentation this morning, where when we talk of employment, we should be thinking of playing a role in both informal and formal employment setup. Not, not, not just informal, casual projects that we create that have no lifespan. To me, that would be keeping a dream alive. A case example, I would like to share with you is that of Mr. A, aged between 30 and 35, single and unemployed. He was staying with his parents and his younger sister. His home was about two kilometers from the hospital. He was diagnosed with bipolar mood disorder. He used to come to the hospital for treatment review on a monthly basis. When I first met him, he had relapsed. On assessment, he came across as a very intelligent, motivated person. He had intellectual insight, and his main concern about his illness centered around the stigma and the isolation by his community. Neighbors would laugh at him and this led him feeling rejected, which led to him to frequent relapses. Two weeks after starting occupational therapy treatment, he was discharged. Arrangements were made for him to continue with occupational therapy on a daily basis. An opportunity was created for him to run a shoe repairing project using his own materials. He managed to generate income to buy more materials. A follow-up interview revealed that his community thought that he was working full-time in the hospital and as such showed respect to him and he was better accepted by his community. He was a proud and a happy man as a result of using occupation that was a that way of value to him and brought meaning to his life when relating to his community. To me, that was a very touching case study. To say, if you bring meaning to a person's life and is valued by his community, he becomes a happy man. Delegates and colleagues, I'm not viewing Mr. A from a simplistic point of view. Like each one of us here, he's an occupational being 
as Wilcock in 1993 said. We should engage in occupation to find meaning and purpose, as Lanson, Wood, and Clark said also in 2003. Improving, improve health and well-being, as Christensen and Townsend said, and needed occupational balance, as Beckham also said in his life. All I'm doing is to reason with reality and argue that meaningful occupation and life for those who are underprivileged may be seen from an economic point of view than any other point of view. Why a hidden key in my topic? Developing countries like South Africa are faced with reality of diverse contexts, as we have already said communities that have varied economic challenges, whereas there are multiple factors that influence occupational choices, like availability of resources and culture, poor, social, uh, socio poor economic condition, often lead to individuals opting for paid occupations to survive, particularly in poor areas. They opt for paid occupation. If you do everything, anything, they do anything and get paid for, any time of the day, 24 hours. Crouch states in 2010 states that the value of occupation will depend on the needs of the person and the needs of those in, in the social structure. That's the value of the occupation. The Western view of life and health have undoubtedly influenced the focus of occupational therapy as a profession. I think that if the developments were rather influenced by the needs of the community in developing countries, the philosophy of OT and the focus will be different. That's what I think. Factors that influence choices of occupation are biological, psychological, and contextual in nature. Economic factors which are part of contextual Factors tend to determine the impact of, on, of other factors. When people make choices of the occupation they engage in. And I have made this observation. In situations where economic factors are taken care of, the other factors seems to be manageable. Because there's adaptation and there's always an alternative solution. But where in situation, where economic factors are not addressed, all other factors becomes a reality. Birman, in 1986, emphasized that the African continent is a, in a dilemma because of its extreme pressure on its black inhabitants to develop a Western-originated society, a Western type of ego consciousness with Western goals and measures of achievement. Berman further said that to appreciate what influences occupational style choices, one need to understand and respect fully or enter into the inner world of another. Undoubtedly, the inner world of the majority of the population in South Africa is clouded by poverty and low socioeconomic condition. Incoming generation, generating project are viewed as priority by the majority of the population. South African community from both urban and rural areas are observed, and this, you can go out and observe this. They are observed, they are observed to carry on with their lives regardless of their harsh reality, by striving to improve their lives, by seeking employment, and participating in income generating projects. If you go to big cities and see what people are prepared to do to earn a living, there's a case which during the previous government, the, the parties that were contesting used to repeat every now and then. We, we have people in Pretoria who stays in one area in Mpumalanga. They are bused in from Mpumalanga to Pretoria by bus. They leave home at 3 a.m. 
to be in the city at 7 in the morning, and they leave the city at 6 p.m. to be home at 9 p.m. And one of the parents said, I only see my children on Saturday evening and Sunday throughout the week. And that's how far people are prepared to go to earn a living. But I do think that if we put our heads together, we are such a dynamic profession that can make an impact in improving the livelihood of people. Arguably, one can say that some of our communities were expected to render, that we are expected to render services to seem not to have a luxury to freely choose. My argument in this lecture is that addressing such community economic challenges will enable them to choose meaningful occupation. The metaphor, hidden keys, means that as therapists, we are expected to apply our creative thinking, maybe in line with what Vona stood for, when selecting and making recommendations that of what could be regarded as economic occupations. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about crafts at a corner of a street. I'm talking about occupations that will improve the economic livelihood of our communities. In addition, therapists need to initiate and develop strategies that lead to sustainable economic empowerment. Occupational therapy, in my view, is one of the professions that can make a difference, be it with people living with disability or without. I would like to argue that those occupational risk factors which tend to produce ill health and dysfunction, which I referred to earlier, can be best addressed by addressing the basic needs first through the use of economic occupations particularly amongst the poor community. I do think that if we empower them and they are economically independent, the issue of occupational deprivation and imbalance will be a thing of the past or will be easy for us to address. BAM in 2010 emphasizes that occupational therapists are being asked to respond and act on the needs of the society through the healthcare system and community system. My observation is that the community systems have not been explored enough. BAM further reminds occupational therapists that the public usually think things of work when we talk about occupations. So when you go into a community and say, I'm going to introduce occupations that are meaningful and so on, they are already thinking of work. That's, that's what, and when they see that you are not creating job opportunity, you won't see them again. It's not that they are not interested. We are a profession that is well equipped to embark on a drive to ensure occupational empowerment. That's what Duncan in 2008 says. We can ensure that it takes place at a larger scale. The profession is aware. We are all aware and yet there's no commitment to such an approach. Instead, the profession focuses on approaches tried and tested in developing countries whose population's needs are completely different. I've been to Sudan several times. What matters to them, according to my observation, is to go on summer holiday than anything else. You talk to any one of them, poor or rich if they have different classes, but summer holiday and holiday is priority. In the developing countries, you go to Tanzania, I've been, you go to Malawi, I've been, you go to Zimbabwe, where we were there last year. What, mean, what is meaningful is to be empowered economically. The issue of them going on uh, uh, visits and so on is secondary. They visit family to satisfy other social needs. And I think as a profession, we, we, instead, we, we need to start looking at this. Hence, economic occupation should be seen as a hidden key, a solution, and the answer to transformation. 
I think if we address that, the transformation process will move on. I've observed communities in South Africa, once they have a means, they, they, they are economically empowered, they improve their lives. They improve their lives. I think the profession needs to position itself such that it could go on to partnership with government. I mean it well. Talk to Sharon Brentnell, the current WFOT president. Talk to Marilyn Peterson. Look at the nature of the job they do. They will tell you that you can't move the world unless it's in cooperation with big business. And everything is run by business. It's interesting when society wants to change. Look at the UK, when the Scottish people want to be there on their own. It's big business that is saying it won't work for us. It, never mind what the society wants. So I think it's time to go into partnership with government, non-governmental organization, businesses to create opportunity and possibility for our clients to become economically independent. And more training in the field of work should be part of the curriculum. Not just to do vocational rehabilitation. I think we need to introduce modules, modules that have to do with entrepreneurship so that OTs can use occupation with a full understanding. Ways should be explored to advance the use of traditional and cultural activity as a means to earn a living with full ownership. The profession should strive to develop strategy to be the link between clients, communities, and businesses. What is painful in developing countries, I will use Tanzania as an example. The local people have no say in the business of Mount Kilimanjaro. Actually, they work as porters. And they can't even afford to go there because it's charged in euros and dollars and whatever. And you start asking yourself, if that business was run for the benefit of the local community, there will be a lot of development. There are many such cases that I think you are, you are fully aware of. I, I, I'm not taking this very lightly. I've just put a few suggestions here. You know better. I'm talking about us going to big companies like ShopRite and Checkers. I'm talking about SOTs going to pick and pay, and many other countries using our skill, our abilities, our, our connections to try and drive the economic agenda. I'm talking about OTASA as an association, starting to look at what are the possibilities of doing this. I know that the ethical rules and so on will put a lot of challenges, but there could be ways around this so that we really empower our communities. I'm not talking about a small garden at a corner. I'm talking about big farming projects, like the dream I always we, uh, uh, have, if one day I have the means, to own a farm run by people with disability, particularly the clients I work with in mental health and psychiatry. Before I close, I, I, I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us and refer us back to the Otasa definition of OT, which is published on the WFOT website. That definition is very eloquent. It summarizes the South African context and the challenges. But I think it binds us, even if though we, try, we ignore it all the time. The definition says we should be involved with all people who have occupational dysfunction. Okay? All people who are occupationally deprived. But traditionally, following our traditional philosophy, what do we do? We tend to focus on those with disability and ignore the others. And I think I want to challenge us to relook at that definition and say, are we really implementing what 
that de definition binds us to do. Because we, we said we're in South Africa, diverse context, this is what we do. In 2018, when WFOT comes here, if they ask us about the other side of our definition, what will we show them in terms of economic empowerment, in terms of community development, in terms of making life meaningful to our clients? I'm encouraged, and I'm sure you are already aware of what I'm doing. I'm referring you to all important sources, work done by South African, so that you can go and look. It's written in our context, not in American or, and we appreciate to learn from them. But there are South African who have taken that a step further. The South African Journal of OT 2010, special edition on human rights, the right to access rehabilitation, remind us as practitioners of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. I think that OT is a better position to more promote most of these rights. For persons with disabilities, particularly those related to education, habilitation, rehabilitation, work, and employment. And I'm saying this so that you shouldn't not misinterpret what I'm saying. We continue with the agenda of what our profession stands for, but let's take it a step further. Having said that, our paradigm shift should include investigating ways of addressing needs of those with disability and those without disability. I'm concluding now. I would like to conclude by quoting Watson, who says, the value and the power of appropriate occupational therapy approach lies in its sensitivity and responsiveness to clients' express needs, and not in the therapist assumptions. And I think when you go to our community, the poor community, even if they say nothing, you can see for yourself the body language, the environment, the circumstances, the facilities they have. And if you meet them halfway in addressing those needs, you will have done what I think should be the way forward for our profession in developing countries. As we adopt a new agenda, develop new strategies, and utilize occupation to empower our clients and their communities, let us directly find out from them what their priority needs are. I would like to, ded to, to dedicate this paper to my family, friends, and colleagues for their support throughout my career. Thank you. <laughs>